Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and thanks to our friends over at Jay-Z Microphones, we get to walk through some of the most important and useful techniques for miking drums, particularly looking at overhead mic techniques. And today we're going to get into some slightly more advanced mic techniques. I actually have a really popular video from years ago. I think the first video I ever did on YouTube was all about overhead mic techniques. This was way back in 2013 or so, and I think that whole series has about a million views on it. But there's a couple of mic techniques I didn't do in that video that I wish I had done. And we'll go into a little bit more detail in these techniques that are maybe slightly more advanced. And we'll get to hear them this time with large diaphragm condenser microphones, specifically these amethyst condenser microphones from Jay-Z. The amethyst condensers, these are probably some of the thickest, richest, fattest, smoothest sounding condensers out there new on the market today. I absolutely love these. I've used these on the podcast. I've used them in a lot of my videos and they just have really cool tone, just a little beefier and fuller than your average large diaphragm condenser microphone while still having the clarity and detail you want out of a condenser. I love them on things like male vocals in particular, on drums, on all sorts of acoustic instruments, guitar cabs, bass cabs, even on kick drum. We'll get to hear it there later. And I want to look today at some variations in detail on a couple of different ways to mic drums. There are really two general approaches to miking drums from an overhead perspective, where you're trying to pick up the entirety of the kit. And that is one to use a coincident pair. That's where the capsules are practically touching. The easiest one to use is what's like called an XY configuration, where the two microphones are pointing about 90 degrees away from each other. So if you were the drum kit, one microphone is pointing 45 degrees away from you. The other is pointing 45 degrees in the other direction. And a variation on that, also technically a coincident technique, is where you have the two microphones spaced about seven inches apart, six and three quarters inches, and tilted out by about 110 degrees. That's called ORTF. This is called XY. And these are good because they give you a nice, solid, cohesive center, good mono compatibility, and some stereo spread. But when you want a lot of stereo spread, the spaced pair is the way to go. And you really want those cymbals and toms to spread out over the left-right spectrum. But there's more than one way to do a spaced pair. And we're going to talk about two of the major approaches of doing those today. We'll also look at two variations of spaced pair techniques where one of the microphones sits directly over the snare drum pointing down. And we're going to get into a little bit of detail on that, comparing the Glyn Johns technique to the Recorder Man technique. What are those? Why do they have those names? Well, we'll talk about that in some detail, and you'll be able to hear those approaches as well. And just for good fun, I also want to show you that you don't always need to mic drums in stereo at all. In fact, my preference sometimes is to Just do a single mono overhead or just one mic pointing at the drum kit and then maybe another mic on kick. And sometimes having a really centered mono drum kit is the way to go because everything else can sound super stereo that way. But on those occasions where you want a lot of stereo spread, the spaced pairs are the way to go. And I'm going to get into a couple variations on those in just a second. Right before we do, a big shout out to my friend Chris Swist, who is playing drums on this in his studio, Even Fall Studios in New Hampshire. We're recording through some lovely Millennium mic pre's he has there, really clean and transparent, so really no additional coloration. You're just hearing the sound of the drum kit, his room, and these microphones. I am folding in a little bit of a kick drum microphone to support these, just a touch, because that's how you're usually going to hear overheads in context. Even if you're trying to use your overheads to pick up the whole sound of the kit, usually there'll be a microphone on the kick to beef that up a little bit. And I just thought to give you the most practical case scenario of how these overhead techniques will actually sound, putting that D12 inside the kick drum was an important thing to do. Okay, on to stereo mic techniques. One of my favorite approaches to miking up a drum kit is the space pair technique. And this is fantastic because it gives you really widespread of cymbals and of toms. And in the traditional, I would call it old school method to spaced pair, you're usually going to center the kick drum. And that's exactly what I did for the first mic technique I'm going to show you. 
I center the kick drum between these two microphones. I think it was about 48 inches almost exactly between the capsules of the two microphones to the kick drum. So the kick is super centered in the stereo image. However, this means that the snare drum leans a little bit to the side, to the audience right or drummer left, because that's just where a snare drum is in the drum kit if you hear it from a ways back or if you're the drummer. It's just slightly off-center. And I like this classic approach because it just sounds like so many of my old favorite classic records in which this technique was used. And to me, it feels a little bit more like standing in front of a kit in real life or being at the drum kit in real life. However, this is not the only way to do a spaced pair. And I got feedback on the last microphone video I did years and years ago on overhead techniques because I did not include what is some people's favorite approach. And that is to take the spaced pair and turn it 45 degrees so that both the kick and snare are centered between the two overhead mics. I knew about this technique when I did the past video. I even used that microphone technique on several occasions before that past video. And although that is the case, I didn't include it in my prior videos. So this time I wanted to. And I wanted to let you guys know that you don't just have to have these two microphones pointing down at the kick drum with the kick drum in the center the way that an audience member would see it. If you tilt the microphones by 45 degrees, you can center both the kick and the snare. And I measured from both of these capsules to about the middle lug on the snare drum, right between the kick and the snare, and got the center point of both the kick and the snare together about 48 inches away from both capsules of the microphone. And you'll hear that this changes things slightly. To me, the stereo spread on the cymbals and the toms becomes a little bit less wide, but the snare does get dragged back into the center a little bit more, and it's a slightly tighter pattern and maybe a slightly more modern sound. And there are some producers and engineers who swear by this approach instead. And I want to allow you to hear both of those approaches side by side so you can get a feel for how they differ. Now, when you rotate them 45 degrees, which one of those mics do you rotate forward or back? Do you take the microphone that's on the hi-hat side and that one comes forward and the one by the floor tom comes back? Or is it vice versa? Well, that's for you to decide. We did it both ways. Last quick note before we get listening. Of course, if you're listening on something like a phone, that's not ideal. If you're listening on headphones or decent studio monitors, you should get a real sense for how the stereo spread changes. Because the variations we're talking about here are a little bit subtle because all three of these approaches are somewhat similar. So ditch the phone or the laptop speaker for this kind of critical listening if you want to hear the subtle differences that we're talking about today. Also, each of these is a uniquely different performance. We have Chris playing basically the same groove, basically the same tempo, but there could be slight variations from take to take. But even with that being the case, I think you can get a pretty good sense for how the stereo width and center image changes in each of these microphone configurations. All right, I just have to throw it in there. There's one other fun and funky way to approach spaced pairs. This one is less common, but the first time I heard someone do it on a session, it floored me. It absolutely sounded stunning on that particular day. 
And this particular engineer did it with a pair of ribbon mics. And this is to have both the microphones behind the drummer pointing towards the drum kit. So instead of being overhead pointing down, we have the mics behind the drummer pointing forward, almost hearing the drum kit how the drummer hears the drum kit. Now, there can be a lot of variation in this technique. The higher up they go, the more cymbals you get. The lower down to the floor they go, the more of the kind of skin and tone of the drums they get. So that I didn't do a ton of different <laughs> variations on this one, I just put them in kind of one happy medium place where maybe there's a little bit of an accent towards the cymbals, but you could easily pull this pair further down towards the ground to emphasize the skin and tone of the drums a little bit more. Some people will use this as an additional stereo pair on top of overheads. Some people will use it just by itself. And I actually kind of like the way kick drums sound from this side. It's how the kick drum sounds to the actual drummer. You get a little bit more beater. And quick tip, if you're ever miking a drum kit and have some extra channels, extra mics lying around, it can be fun to mic the beater side of a kick drum. It really gives a different impression of what that kick drum sounds like. And this gets a little bit of that vibe. Okay, for our next techniques, we are going to look at Glenn Johns technique and recorder man technique. And these techniques are named after people. Glenn Johns was a fabulous engineer. The Johns brothers, Glenn and Andy Johns, did a whole bunch of great records, notably a lot of the Led Zeppelin stuff, but so many of the classic rock records from the 70s that people love the sound of. And the Glenn Johns approach is really interesting because it's almost a variation on just an overhead mic approach. If you were going to do a single overhead mic on a drum kit, just taking that sucker and pointing it right down to the center of the snare could be a good way to go. And that's where the Glenn Johns technique starts. The first microphone goes down, pointing right straight at the snare from up overhead. And the second microphone goes about six inches above the top of the floor tom, looking across at the snare drum. And you match the distance from the mic over the snare to the snare and the mic over the floor tom to the snare. And you get those equidistant so that you get perfect phase coherence on that snare drum. I have them again about 48 inches from the snare drum on both of these microphones. And you would pan these microphones out left and right. Sometimes hard panning this 100% can be a little extreme for people. So sometimes playing around with just how much you're panning out that snare mic, maybe you're only panning out that one mic by 50 instead of 100. You experiment, you find a spot, you adjust level potentially up and down if need be, you're still going to have good phase coherence and mono compatibility, especially on that all-important snare drum. And then to pick up a little additional kick and to center the kick drum even more, there is a third mic that's pointing at the kick drum or inside the kick drum. The recorder man technique is a variation on this. The recorder man technique, named after apparently some guy named recorder man on the internet, is a technique that's a little bit like the Glenn Johns with a subtle variation where you have one microphone still pointing out the snare drum, but the other microphone is looking in over the drummer's shoulder at the snare drum. Once again, you're trying to measure these two microphones so that it's basically the same distance from the mic pointing down at the snare to the snare and the mic over the shoulder to the snare. This again gives you good phase coherence, center image, and mono compatibility for the all-important snare drum, amplifying the kick drum with an additional kick drum mic either placed inside the kick drum or placed outside the kick drum. Any of these techniques you could probably add on the snare drum mic as well for most styles of popular music. If you have the extra line, you probably should. It's not always necessary, particularly with things like the Glenn Johns mic technique that we'll get to a little bit later, but usually to get enough snare in a really dense mix, adding on a snare mic makes sense. However, so you could hear how the snare sounds different and really hear the differences in the scenario spread, we left out the snare mic for these audio examples. This is another one where opinions on how far to pan each of these mics vary. You could do this recorder man technique in straight mono and get a good overall picture of the kit. 
without spreading it in stereo at all. You could go super hard panning, or you could go somewhere in between. To let you hear the most dramatic difference as possible, for this example, I'm going to spread those two microphones out all the way. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to those variations on this top-down approach to miking with overheads. Just for fun, I also wanted to do the totally straight mono version where you just have one mic pointing basically down at a snare drum, and then we took the other Jay-Z amethyst and put that in front of the kick drum outside the kick drum to get a little bit more tone and boom off of the kick drum. And let's listen to that one as well. Now, there are so many more drum miking techniques we could get into. I think the last two that I have to mention really quickly, just to make this video complete, is, again, XY and ORTF. And with XY pairs, you could probably do them like this over drums most of the time, getting them maybe over the center of the kick, maybe over the center of the snare, maybe centered over both kick and snare together. That's one approach. Or one of my favorite stereo miking techniques, the ORTF approach, which I think is a lovely happy medium between coincident pairs and spaced pairs. That's where you have the mics about seven inches, six and three quarters inches apart from each other, pointing out at about 110 degrees. The problem with these techniques is they don't have as much stereo spread, which isn't necessarily a problem, but they can also be a little awkward on really big, wide drum kits. And in fact, at Chris's studio, he's got a really big, wide drum kit. It's just not your standard three or four piece rock drum kit. He's got a super wide kit. And unfortunately, at the day we recorded this video, not super long boom arms. So it was actually really awkward to get the XY and ORTF pairs going. So they look a little funny, and they're not where I would traditionally aim to point these. You have a few different options. The closer you go to the front of the kick drum, where the audience would be, the more of the sound of the metal and cymbals you're going to get. The further back you go towards the drummer, usually the more of the sense of tone and skins you're going to get. For this particular configuration on this particular day with the boom arms that Chris had that particular day, it was hard to do anything but putting them near the front of the kit, getting a little bit more metal than I think is ideal. But this isn't the way these approaches have to sound. And Chris, after making this video, went out and bought slightly longer boom arms. So if anyone wanted to do XY or ORTF on his kick at some other point, they'd be able to more easily. So you'll see these are slightly awkwardly placed. They don't look super clean and well positioned. And again, they're not in my ideal spot for these mic techniques. But for completeness, I wanted to throw them in there. It's ironic, on a smaller drum kit, these are two of the easiest approaches to do, but on a big, wide drum kit, they can be two of the more hard and difficult approaches to do. And I often think on big, large, wide drum kits, the space pair approaches often work better for my taste. But this video isn't just about me. It's about you. What are your favorites? Listen to these two. Let us know what you think in the comments down below.
All right. I hope you enjoyed listening to those patterns as well. Again, a little bit of kick drum folded in and we've got them panned out hard left, right. On all of these mic techniques, I used Jay-Z Amethyst microphones for the overheads. These, again, are some of my favorite large diaphragm condenser mics, especially when you want a really rich, fat, full-sounding large diaphragm condenser that still has the detail that you want out of a condenser microphone. While they sound like, some people will say, a little bit in the Neumann U67-ish direction, but maybe a little bit more modern with a little bit of a tone of its own, Plenty of bottom end and really nice, smooth, clean top end. Love them for things like drums. Love them for things like male voice, bass cabs, kick drums, electric guitar cabinets, potentially things like acoustic guitar, and a whole lot more. So big thanks again to Jay-Z Microphone for sending some of these and helping make this series possible. Big thanks to Chris Swiss, awesome drummer at his awesome studio, Evenfall Studios in New Hampshire. Absolutely great guy to work with and a killer drummer as well. And big thanks to you for hanging out with us. Let us know what your favorite techniques were in the comments down below. If we left off one of your favorites, let us know in the comments as well. Bear in mind that your favorite today, all of this could change depending on the needs of the particular production you're working on depending on the particular room you're in, the particular drum kit you're recording, the player and that player's style. Based on all of this, the ideal microphone technique can vary. And you don't even need to use stereo mic techniques at all. One of the cool things about super wide stereo techniques is you get a beautiful spread of cymbals and toms across the soundstage. But having super wide drums can sometimes detract from having other things be super wide. Do you want really super wide sounding guitars or synths? Well, then you might want more mono sounding drums. So those are some trade-offs worth thinking about as well. So get playing around with this stuff for yourself. Thanks for hanging out with me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.